Well, thank you very much. Shane, it's a delight to be with you. And uh, I had a great time this morning. I'm going to take this off of here and use it this way. I got to do some pheasant hunting this morning with uh, Senator Grassley, although he didn't hunt. He stayed back at the lodge, and we did a fundraiser for him. But uh, if you have not looked at my Instagram account, I want you to do it, or my Twitter account, because, of course, we have video of a great shot that you really, really need to see. And I posted it with this little uh, caveat. This is not a PETA-approved photo. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you to figure out how it turned out. Uh, we had a great time, and uh, one of the great things about coming to places like Iowa is you get to experience new things. I duck hunt, turkey hunt, deer hunt. Uh, can't pheasant hunt in Arkansas. There aren't any. So uh, only the second time I've ever been able to do it. Once was uh, eight years ago, and then today. And then tomorrow I'll be doing some pheasant hunting with uh, Congressman King over in Northwest Iowa. So if for no other reason, running for president has been a phenomenal experience because I've been able to take some pheasants right out of the sky and bring them to the ground and put them in somebody's pot. Folks, thank you for giving me the opportunity to visit with you. I know that uh, there are a couple of options. I can speak and answer a few questions. I can answer more questions and speak less. And I would let you take the vote but I'm a little concerned about that because I know that if I said, would you like me to speak or do questions, some of you would say, neither one. Would you please vacate the building? <laughs> you know, that's what I felt like the other night on the stage with CNBC. How many of you watched that debate and wished you hadn't? That's what I thought. Uh, I was, frankly, I was wishing I could watch the World Series, too. Uh, whole night, get three questions. But I tell you, CNBC has done something that I didn't think was possible. They have brought together all of the Republican presidential candidates in one accord. We all are equally frustrated and disgusted with the mainstream media attempting to manipulate the process of selecting the next Republican nominee and the next president of the United States. And I think it's one of the good things that happened as a result of the other night. Here's my frustration. Throw all the hard questions you want to at me. After all, I'm running for president. I'm expecting those. Want to ask me about economic policy, why I support the fair tax, why I think that uh, canning American workers and bringing in foreign workers on H1, H-1B visas is a terrible idea, why I think we ought to be railing against the Disney Corporation, which is supposed to be the happiest place on earth, but instead they've made their American workers train their foreign replacements after they fired them. That would be something worth talking about. I'd love to be talking about how do we transform the healthcare system so that we focus on prevention and cures, which is the only way to economically survive it because we never can survive it if we just keep throwing money into it. The whole system is upside down. And just saying we're going to repeal Obamacare does nothing to help the people in your family who have the kind of diseases that are running the cost up. And it's why I think it's long past time that we start having a visionary approach to health care in this nation. Not to see how much more money we can spend to treat the diseases that just keep getting worse, but we have just enough health care so that people can extend their lives for a longer period of time, even though the cost of doing that is skyrocketing and is cost prohibitive. And I want to start talking about how do we change that paradigm so that instead of just paying more money at the end of life for diseases that are out of control, we actually prevent those diseases or cure them like we did polio back when I was a little kid in the 50s. Because you know what? You know how much money we had to spend last year in America on polio? We didn't spend any. You know why? Because we eradicated that disease 60 years ago. What if we did the same thing with a president who said within the next decade, we will end cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. We're going to find a cure. It sounds like that's a little ambitious. It was pretty ambitious in 1961 when John F. Kennedy said, we'll send a man to the moon and we'll bring him back within the decade. He did not live to see that. I did. In the summer of 1969, I remember sitting in our family room in front of the old black and white television set, 
long before there was any such thing as cable in my neighborhood. And on one of the three stations that we got, all three of them were running their coverage. I was watching the Walter Cronkite version on CBS. And I remember when Neil Armstrong put his first foot on the surface of the moon in words that I'll never forget. And if you were alive during that time, you won't either. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And today, if you have a cell phone, if you watched a satellite weather report, if you've ever had an MRI, if you've had a heart cath, if you've ever used a GPS to get somewhere and you didn't have to stop at Goober's service station and ask for directions because the GPS got you there more efficiently, you can thank the space program for that and a whole lot of other major innovations that we have in this country that had nothing to do with going to space but have everything to do with improving our economy, technology, and the quality of life that we now enjoy. What if this country decided that we would do more than just throw money at a broken health care system? What if instead the focus was on cures to the four diseases I just mentioned? And do you know what would transform? Not just the health care system, but the nation's economy. Alzheimer's alone is going to be a $1.1 trillion disease by the year 2050. Already we spend hundreds of billions of dollars on cancer treatment, heart disease, and diabetes every single year. The costs are going up, not down. In fact, in Alzheimer's alone, the average out-of-pocket cost for a family after Medicare pays, after insurance pays, for the long-term cost is $287,000 per family for one Alzheimer's patient. Can you write that check today? You cannot. My guess is that everyone in this room has experienced one or more of those diseases within your immediate family. You personally, your mother, your father, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, are one of your closest friends. The circle doesn't have to be much bigger than close around you. And I would bet, in fact, I've never been in the place yet where there was a person who said, hey, I've never been that close to any one of those four diseases. Most people say, I've been there many times, many family members. Now, if that seems like something, why would we be talking about it as president? Because we can't fix our economy until we get some of the big cost drivers under control. And that, my dear friend, is one of the biggest cost drivers in our culture. Yes, I'm for reforming the tax code. As most of you may know, I don't believe we can fix the current tax system. And when I hear people say, I have a tax plan, they'll tell me what is unique about it, but every tax plan still involves paying taxes on our income. It still involves penalizing your productivity, taxing your work, taxing your savings, taxing your investments, taxing your inheritance. The fair tax untaxes all of your productivity. And folks, I don't know how you raised your kids, but I don't know how I raised mine. If there was a behavior in them that I wanted more of, I rewarded that behavior. And if there was a behavior in them that I wanted less of, I punished the behavior. Forgive me, punishing is, I realize, politically incorrect these days. And now we consequence children. I grew up when we got punished. I don't know how you grew up. I was never consequenced. By gosh, I was punished. I tell people my father was the most patriotic man I ever knew. He laid on stripes, I saw stars. But I learned the common sense of how to raise a child. And all of us understand that. Why is it that our government does everything to us that is counterintuitive to building a strong economy? When you penalize people for working, saving, investing, leaving something for the next generation, you ultimately get less of it. And when you reward reckless irresponsibility instead of consequencing it, and you give big banks $700 billion and bail them out because somebody in Washington decides they're too big to fail. What that trans translates to is you're too small to matter. I don't buy that. I don't think Washington ought to be bailing out the big banks and insurance companies. And I didn't think so in 2007 and 2008. A lot of the Republican establishment thought that that's what we had to do and they used the excuse, we don't have a choice. Why? Our economy can't, can't withstand it. 
Well, I assure you that what we have done is more detrimental to our economy than having bailed out Goldman Sachs and AIG and Bear Stearns and the big companies on Wall Street because here's what's happened. We've learned so much that we just this week borrowed another trillion and a half dollars against the federal budget. Can anybody here tell me that that's how you would operate in your household if you were this high in debt? That your answer to that would be borrow some more? I know what you would do. You would do what I have done in my own life. The same thing we all have to do. First thing, you'd stop a lot of your spending. You'd cut back dramatically. You wouldn't go out to eat. You wouldn't go to movies. You wouldn't buy a new car. You wouldn't take long and nice vacations. You'd stay home. You'd drive the old clunker. Even Obama wouldn't be able to buy it off of you. You'd keep your clunker. And then something else would start happening. You'd start selling off assets to pay your bills. Janet and I had been married for a year when she was diagnosed with cancer of the spine. That's a scary thing when you're 20 years old and a newlywed. And I was in grad school, and I'm going to tell you something. It was the scariest time of our lives because we were first told she probably would not survive the cancer and then told that they would attempt to remove the tumor which was in the canal of her spine, but if they were able to remove it, there was more than likely the probability that they would have to sever her spinal cord in order to get the tumor out, and that would leave her paralyzed from the waist down. That was the best they gave us in terms of our hopes and what they thought the prognosis would be. By the grace of God and a lot of prayers from a lot of people, she survived the surgery, and after the surgery, pretty much had to learn to walk again. Six weeks of radiation, and in those days, this was 1975, they pretty much said, well, you're kind of microwaving your insides. You'll never have children. So we didn't expect that we ever would get to have children, but, you know, at that point, she was alive, and that seemed like a pretty good gift from God. And a few months later, I came home one day from class. We were barely eking out a living, the two of us. And she said, guess what, I've been to the doctor. I said, is everything okay? She says, well, I don't know, it depends on how you look at it. Well, that's scary when you've just gone through a year of cancer. <laughs> and she says, I'm pregnant. And I was shocked because that wasn't supposed to be a possibility. And today we have three children and five grandchildren none of whom we were supposed to be able to have. But when that first little guy was on his way, guess what happened? With all those obligations coming and very little assets to pay for them, not only did we cut back on what we had already cut back on, and I mean bare bones, we lived in a $40 a month duplex apartment, and at $40 a month, it was grossly overpriced, I want to tell you now. <laughs> we did something else. I had some guitars that I had worked hard all my teenage years from the time I started playing at the age of 11. And I had bought guitars, sold guitars, and kept buying up through the little uh, bands I played in and make a little money and get a better guitar. I had two really good guitars. Unless you're a guitar person, this probably wouldn't mean anything to you. But if you're a musician and you've ever gotten the guitars of your dreams, and then one day, here's the choice. Guitars for yourself are groceries and diapers for your baby. And it was a hard decision, yeah. I, I had, you know, it really wasn't. Because I was so grateful to God that those, those opportunities were now going to be mine to be a father. But it wasn't easy and it wasn't fun when I put an ad in a paper and said, I've got guitars for sale. And the night that a man and his son came and bought both my bass guitar and the other six-string Gretsch Tennessee and guitar that I had and walked out of my little apartment with them, I'm going to tell you something. It hurt. It hurt. And I had to just turn away because I'd spent years and sacrifice to get those guitars. And they walked out the door. I never let on to Janet how much that meant to me, but, you know, she knew. But did I regret it? Did I resent it? No. Because you know what? I had an obligation. I had a son who was on his way, and I needed to take care of him. Why doesn't our country understand it has a responsibility to its obligations. Instead, we just borrowed another trillion and a half dollars, and guess where some of the money came from? 
the Congress borrowed another $150 billion out of Medicare to pay for it. And then the politicians say, Medicare and Social Security are going broke. Well, I guess so. You've been stealing from it for decades. You bet it's going broke. And now the answer to that, instead of saying we're going to be responsible and stop spending money we don't have and borrowing money we can't afford to pay back, now the answer is, well, by gosh, we'll just spend some more and tell you you're going to have to work longer and that you're not going to get the money that you paid in out of your paycheck. Let me be clear. That isn't the government's money. They didn't ask you if you wanted it taken out of your check. They took it out of your check without your permission. And by law, you didn't have a choice to say, no, I think I'll just keep that. And now they want to say, eh, forget about it. You're not going to get it. Or you might get to work an extra 10 years instead of retiring when we promised that you could. That is not welfare. It is not an entitlement. It is your money. And I'm tired of the government stealing from us and lying to us and then blaming us for the problem. I'm tired of that. The government owns 24% of the land in America. 24%. Think about that. One in every four acres of land in this country is owned by the federal government, and a bunch of it west of the Mississippi. If the government is that broke, maybe it's time to have a real estate sale. Maybe it is time for us to put that land in the hands of private individuals. Maybe it's time to start putting that land on tax rolls instead of having it tax exempt. Of all the assets that we have, including timber assets, oil, gas, and coal assets that we sit on top of that the federal government could turn loose for money, maybe it's time to start making sure that the mineral use of that federal property is able to be turned into the trillions of dollars that it is worth so that we can get out of this debt because that's what you would do in your house you would get rid of some assets that you really can't afford to keep in order to pay your bills. <laughs> well, I want to just uh, take a few moments to answer questions. Look, I'd love to talk all day, but I, what, how much time have I got left? Well, I'm okay, but I, I want to be respectful of the time that was allocated, so... Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me take uh, a few questions if anyone has one. And uh, can be yes, sir. Governor, my name is Frank Ingersoll. I've uh, been born and raised in Iowa. Seven years of college. I, I'm a coach. I like to coach. It's like your car coach. Really kept that. Uh, we have a situation in Iowa here where the federal government has usurped their authority. Sodomy is against the law on the books this very day, and the Supreme Court has issued a decree, and we have states' rights here. They have no jurisdiction over Iowa, just as they have no jurisdiction over the prostitution in Las Vegas, Nevada. What we are asking for is we're asking for some brave soul to stand up and say that this is wrong. You violated states' rights. We're going to impeach the five justices that voted like they didn't have a brain in their head. Well, I think let's be very clear. Um, the court cannot make law. I got into an argument with Chris Cuomo on CNN the other day because he was trying to say to me, the Supreme Court is ruled. That's the law of the land. I said, no, Chris, it isn't. I've read the Constitution, and the court cannot make law. Now, for 70 years in this country, we have pretended that the court can make a law, and we're supposed to just bow down and surrender the executive and legislative branches to the judicial branch. But Jefferson, Jackson, Madison, Lincoln all said that if you do that, then now we're living under judicial tyranny. I mean, look, it's not, it's not that Mike Huckabee is the expert, but I really do think that before I would trust Chris Cuomo, I really would trust Abraham Lincoln... Andrew Jackson, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. And all of them made it very clear, as did the constitutional language itself, and I don't believe it's been repealed, that there are three distinct equal branches of government. There is a separation of powers, and there are checks and balances. And one of the things that the courts can't do is just to create law, because that's legislative power that is assigned exclusively to the Congress, and the judicial branch can't do that. 
They can review a law. But it requires that the people's elected representatives pass a law which has not happened. You say, well, what does that mean? It means that the next president ought to have the courage to say, we appreciate the court decision, but we ignore it because it's not constitutional. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government the authority to dictate or mandate what the definition of marriage is. And until the elected representatives of the people have decided on this, then there's nothing for us to follow other than thank you for your thoughts and opinions. And in the meantime, get a president who will not allow people to be on the courts when he has an appointment, who haven't read the Constitution, and people who will not publicly declare that they do not believe in judicial supremacy and therefore would never try to practice the idea of a judicial tyranny. You got a question back here? Yes, ma'am. The, the 9010 rule says if you don't practice the way that 90% of your colleagues are doing, you're by definition out of date and wrong, or you're by definition wrong, which makes us immediately out of date. We practice 30-year-old medicine. So um, I'm going to give this to one of your handlers here. All right. The middle of this book, it's about the, surviving the medical meltdown, but the middle of the book is the principles of anti-aging medicine. And just as an example, for example, that isn't in the book, about Alzheimer's, the latest stuff to come out of Harvard, Fasano and wheat and the, and the whole issue of, of the bowel and stuff. It's out there. We have a cure probably for cancer that treats all cancers because it shifts the paradigm. It's called, the book's Tripping Over the Truth. The guy writes about this from his research at Johns Hopkins. It's out there. The government gets in the way of us practicing it. And I have an article, Why Your Doctor's Out of Date. And that's exactly the problem. So government can't do it. I just want you to, I hope you understand. I, mean, I think from what you're saying, you do. Government can't make this stuff come about. We can save money in the private industry, private practice, just like Apple Computer. Think if that philosophy were applied to Apple. So, no, I'm not saying that government is going to be the one no, that solves the it. problem, but I think that government research is a part Thank of it. And, and I also believe this, that government's obstacles to innovation is one of the reasons we haven't gotten there yet. It is because there is no collaboration. There is no financial benefit. Let's not kid ourselves. One of the reasons that some things have been able to uh, found, uh, find treatment but not cures, treatment makes a lot of money. Cures don't. Cures don't have a, a whole big financial bonanza. So by the way, one of the ways to do that is to say you come up with a cure, you present it, it's marketable, provable, $100 billion tax-free prize. I don't know what the amount should be, but let me just throw that out there. You think, well, that's a lot of money, a lot less than it costs to continue to spend money to treat the diseases that it could be cured. And so the point being, there's, there's a vested interest in us taking the power away from Congress to manipulate the law which is one of the reasons I think the fair tax is critical, because you eliminate the IRS, you eliminate the tax code. It's the only plan that really does that. And what you end up doing is the very power of Congress, which is to tinker with the tax code, give some people benefits and other people pain, you eliminate it. I think that's very powerful. Shane, we have another question? Anybody? I didn't see anybody raise their hand. OK. OK. You're close enough to the front. We, anybody who's torturing through the front row should definitely get a question. Well, I, uh, I listened to you play guitar at a Trail Life convention in oh, Nashville yeah. as well, so he does play a pretty mean guitar mm -hmm. still. Um, my question really kind of goes back to some of your things on, uh, you mentioned you sold assets, you got rid of things. So I yes. liked your comment about the mineral rights and a way to tap into that, but can you tell me some other things that you might cut or reduce from a federal level if you were president to, to kind of push that stuff back down to local control? Well, one of the big reasons that, that I believe I'm well and uh, very, I won't say uniquely because there are other governors who are running for president, but I think governors have a different perspective and a unique perspective, not only because they've been CEOs of a government and understand how it works and what to do at the executive level, but governors understand why the federal government is out of control because they're the only ones who have dealt with the most practical applications of federal overreach. The Tenth Amendment is being trampled over every single day. There is no federal authority for the Department of Education. Most of what the EPA does is beyond the jurisdiction of a regulatory body, and they're making law that they have no authority to make. You have extraordinary power in federal agencies, even such as commerce, energy. Uh, regulations being made every day that affect not only how you live, but how much it costs you to live. 
Most of those decisions should be made in your local community. The biggest problem with Obamacare is that it took power away from states and local governments and moved it to the federal government so that somebody in Washington is deciding how much insurance you're going to have to have, what you're going to be covered for, even if it's more than you need, want, and can afford. I don't know of anybody in Washington that knows more about what you need than you do. I don't know of anybody in Washington that knows better how to educate your kids than you and your uh, spouse do. And certainly it should be under the jurisdiction of parents first, community second, and depending on how your state constitution is written, ultimately uh, the, your state, but certainly not the federal government. There's not one, not one thing in the federal constitution that says that the federal government shall dictate how kids are educated. And so all of these are ways in which we need to move the power away from Washington back to the local governments. Uh, one thing, for example, I'd move the Department of Homeland Security director and his family to Laredo, Texas, and I say this is going to be your workstation until the border is secure, and until the border is secure, you're not leaving. And we'd build a double fence the entire 1,933 miles. I've been to San Diego where they built the double fence. It took crime 54% down in San Diego and 95% reduction of apprehensions of illegals as soon as they built that fence. Please don't tell me we can't secure our border. We just haven't had a president who had the desire and the will to get it done. And that's why we have to get things like that done. Do the few things that the federal government is supposed to do and leave the rest of the states and the, fed the local governments as it was designed to be in the first place. And our last question. Okay. You had an opportunity uh, to uh, face uh, evil media recently. and. Um, I, I see that as being a very large problem, um, not only for the, the candidates, but for the general public. Um, the vast majority of ears throughout the United States are listening to the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. The lies, the lack of the truth, the lack of information altogether. How do we either stop it, correct it, combat it? Well, one of the benefits we live in today is uh, we have new means of communication the internet provides for us that we didn't have even a generation ago. But the internet is like fire. It can cook our food and it can burn our houses down. It depends on how we use it. And I'm afraid a lot of people, their houses are burning down instead of cooking a nice meal. So we have to be very careful in how we use the information that we get. We need to teach our kids to be their own editors, never to believe stuff because, hey, it's true, it's got to be, it's on the Internet. I don't know how many times I've heard that. But the other big factor is talk to the candidates, ask them. Hold us accountable. You know, if, if I tell you that, that I'm pro-life, demand to, to test me on that. If I tell you that I really don't believe in judicial supremacy, put me to the test. Ask me just exactly what I would do. If I tell you that we will end abortion, not just by promising to have a constitutional amendment, which is fairy dust, to say we're going to do those, but to tell you how I'm going to do it by invoking the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, put me to the test and see if I know what I'm talking about. You see, I, I think that sometimes you un don't understand, while the media you think has a lot of power, guess what? In Iowa, you really have some power. Because who you select to win the Iowa caucuses is going to go on all the way through the process. May not win the nomination, but if you don't win Iowa and at least one other early state, this I guarantee you, you will not be the nominee. You can be Kentucky and go without a loss in the regular season, be number one seed in the NCAA March Madness, but if you don't win early games in, in the March Madness tournament, you do not end up in the Final Four. And you can have all the money leading up to the Iowa caucuses, you can be number one in the polls, but if you lose in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, you will not be in the final four. You won't be the nominee. So look, you have power here, real power. Use it wisely. I close with this admonition. Think about whether or not you believe the presidency is an entry level job. If you think this is an easy job and virtually anybody can do it, then vote for anybody. If you think this job requires an exceptional level of executive skills and a clear understanding of how to navigate through a hostile government and a hostile media, 
And then maybe because of who the likely nominee is, it might even be helpful to have someone who really understands and has consistently fought the Clinton political machine. Then you know what? You'll end up with a real simple conclusion. And you're looking at him. A week ago, a week ago on the way to Iowa, I think I'd been in South Carolina, we were coming here, and we were flying into Cedar Rapids. Got to Atlanta to change planes, as I do several times a week. I'm convinced that when I die and go to heaven, I will stop in Atlanta to change planes on the way. <laughs> well, I'm stuck in Atlanta, and the plane to Cedar Rapids is announced that it's delayed. Here we are at gate D31, and at first they say, well, we're waiting on the airplane. Well, it's kind of nice to have the plane show up. Finally, the plane gets there, and the gate agent says, well, we have a plane, but the crew hasn't arrived. We have a crew coming in from somewhere, and uh, when they get here, we'll start boarding the plane. We waited and waited. They announced a couple of more delays. Two hours into the delay, the, the gate agent, who was trying to be so helpful, he really was. He was a delightful guy, and I appreciated his, his spirit and his uh, many apologies. And he said, folks, we're still waiting on the crew. Hopefully they'll come soon. But in the meantime, I'm just curious. I know you're anxious to get on to Cedar Rapids because it's going to be 1 o'clock in the morning now by the time you get there. But so I'll just ask, would anyone here like to volunteer to fly the plane to Cedar Rapids? <laughs> and you know what? As mad as everybody was about being late, the reaction at gate D31 was identical to what you just did. Everybody laughed out loud. You know why? because it was ludicrous to think that any of us would get on an airplane that would be flown by somebody who had never been in the cockpit. That was ludicrous. We laughed. We said, that's crazy. And we all thought, oh, that's funny. We, we're not going to fly with somebody who's never flown. Of course we wouldn't. I leave you with this question. Are you willing to put your children and grandchildren's future in this country in the hands of someone who has never been in the left seat of the cockpit and never flown the plane. If you believe the presidency is that easy, then your understanding of the job and mine is amazingly different. This is no time to test to see if somebody might be ready you better know, has a person been tested and proven and vetted over the toughest of experiences because you don't elect a president for what he says he will do. You elect a president for the judgment and the seasoned wisdom and maturity that he's already proven to have when he has faced the unexpected. Because as a governor, I'll tell you the truth, I had a very rigid schedule every day. But my real test in my capacity to be a good governor was not could I keep the schedule on all the things that I planned? It was when a tornado came ripping through our state, killing 30 people, and we had to start directing recovery procedures for 250 miles of tornado damage. Or when our state inherited 75,000 evacuees from Hurricane Katrina, and our state's population increased by 3% in five days, and we had to find a place for people to sleep, for their kids to go to school, to get their prescriptions, to get their ID cards, because they came with nothing but the muddy clothes on their back from having stood in water for five days. And to understand how to manage that crisis, you don't elect the president for what you know he's going to face. You elect him for what none of us know he's going to face. If it's another terrorist attack, a natural disaster, something of cataclysmic proportion, has he been tested to sit in that unique executive chair to make those tough decisions? And if you don't think that's important, then the next time I get stuck in Atlanta, I'm going to call on you to come down and fly the plane. <laughs> Thank you, guys, and God bless you. Okay, we're going to take about a 10-minute break. You have a chance to talk to Governor Huckabee.